You know, I've been really surprised the last few days on Facebook and across social media platforms, uh, seeing a lot of people who are posting memes and these sorts of things that are all, you know, Black Lives Matter and these things, and then other people jumping in and saying it's not Black Lives Matter, All Lives Matter, or Blue Lives Matter, Police Lives Matter, and there is there's so much vitriol going in every conceivable direction, given the current state of play when it comes uh, with this Floyd situation, which is just a tragic situation. I wanted to make this this very brief video to be able to explain a little bit about what's going on here uh, in a way that hopefully will be a little bit enlightening, okay? So, uh, I, I, ladies, let, let me speak to you for a second. Uh, have you ever gone to see a video with, uh, with your son or with your father or with your boyfriend or with your husband or whoever, right, male friend, uh, and there's something, maybe it's a slapstick comedy or something like this, and what happens is that uh, in it, the guy's walking around and then all of a sudden, you know, one of these old comedies, right, and a bowling ball comes out of nowhere, a sledgehammer comes out of nowhere, and it hits them right down there, right? And what'll happen is that, you know, you'll probably laugh, it's funny, it's cute, whatever, right? But you look at the guy, you look at the husband or the boyfriend, and he'll be like, ugh. You know, he has like a visceral a visceral reaction to kind of that happening. And that response is different than the response that you had. Why is that, right? So here's the thing. In our brain, right between our eyes, right? They We've got the frontal lobe. It's right here, okay? Now, what a lot of people don't realize is that the frontal lobe right here, you can kind of split it into the top and the bottom of the frontal lobe, okay? Now, the bottom part of the frontal lobe, fancy name, right? Dorsolateral prefrontal cortex, okay? Other side is the ventromedial prefrontal cortex, right? Now, I'm not saying this just to be able to like act smart or something like this. All you need to know is that there's two parts of the brain, of the frontal lobe of your brain, okay? Now, here's the interesting thing about it. When you end up taking a look, let's say at a brain scan, when you're looking at or when you're evaluating somebody who you perceive to be in your same in-group, it could be that you're a guy and they're a guy. It could be that you're straight and they're straight. It could be that they're American and you're American. It could be anything like this. They're white, you're white. Uh, whatever it is, right? If they're in a perceived in-group, then the part of the brain that lights up is the ventromedial prefrontal cortex, okay? If that person is in an out-group, Okay, so I'm a man, the person is happening to is a woman. I'm white, the person is happening to is black. I am mentally uh, stable and the other person is diagnosed with a mental illness. Whatever it happens to be, if the person falls into that category of quote unquote the other, then it's the opposite side, it's the dorsolateral prefrontal cortex, which is going to process that information. Okay, this part of the brain general, frontal lobe, okay, it has to do with judgment judging situations and judging the context of those situations, all right? So imagine, even if we can take everything out, we can take the race out, we can take sex out, we can take sexual orientation, gender identity out, take all of it out. At the end of the day, all I want you to think about is if you get pushed down the stairs by, let's say, uh, a family member versus if you get pushed downstairs uh, by some random person, who are you more likely to call the police on? right? Now, maybe you hate your family, right? But hopefully you don't. Hopefully you got a good relationship with them. In other words, you're more likely to call the police on the stranger who kind of, you know, came out of nowhere and did the thing, right? And the reason why is that we judge people in our in-groups. It doesn't have to be a real in-group. It is the perception of the in-group, right? We judge those people more leniently than we judge people in our out-group. And because of that, what we're seeing right now in real time is this playing out, all right. Now, obviously, with the pandemic and these things, people have been they've been stuck at home and they've been experiencing financial difficulties, emotional difficulties. Human beings are not meant to be, you know, at home watching Tiger King. Right. Try, don't get me wrong. Love me some Tiger King. Carol Baskin definitely did it. You know it. I know it. OK, but that's not what this is about. OK, the idea here is that our brains literally process the information differently. This is why when the guy saw the person in the movie, right, getting hit down there, he had this reaction almost like it was happening to him versus, ladies, you watching it, well, the guy's not in your in-group. And so because of that, it's almost kind of funny. You know, it kind of ends up getting played off, 
right? And this is why oftentimes when things like this happen, like what's going on right now, we essentially say, well, that, that's kind of not happening to me. That's not me. That person's not in my group, so on and so forth. I'm in a strange situation, right? Because I'm multiracial, right? So my mother is white and my father is ethnic, right? Uh, so my father's first generation immigrant from India. So this is one of these things where I really fall right in the middle of this, right? Because I'm not just a total ethnic minority and I'm not somebody who's totally not an ethnic minority, right? And in my life, as anybody who's multiracial would know, you always feel like you don't necessarily fit into one group or the other. We as human beings, the way that our brain has evolved, has literally evolved to be able to categorize things. We want to put stuff into categories automatically. Imagine if I say something like uh, Barbie, Tonka Trucks, My Little Pony, and G.I. Joe. I don't even have to sort it into groups for you. Your brain automatically does it. Okay. Now, the reason that that happens is that our sense of consciousness and rational decision-making is based off of what's called the cerebral cortex, which is the wrinkly part of the brain on the outside, right? But just like if you're looking at something like a peach that's got the pit in the middle, the brain's like that, okay? So the pit, which is underlying the wrinkly part, is something that we have a fancy name for, and it's the limbic cortex, right? And the idea behind the limbic cortex is that it processes the overwhelming preponderance of information that's hitting our five senses at all times. Now, you may say, you know, well, how much is the overwhelming preponderance? Well, it's 99.9999996%. That's how much of the information is being automatically, implicitly, and we call it implicit bias for a reason, it is implicitly being processed. Now, a lot of people, they take that and they just say, well, we got to change it. We got to change it. This is an evolved mechanism that's actually very helpful, though. Imagine that it's me and my, my future son right? And uh, we're in caveman days. And I take the kid out, and we're going for a walk. And there's a bush. And we hear this rustling in the bush, right? Do you really think that it is a good adaptive mechanism that would help me to survive by thinking to myself, Let me, well, I don't want to jump to conclusions here, okay? Let, let's think about this. How much is the, is the bush uh, rustling, right? How big is the animal probably going to be? Uh, how deep, you know, is it, is it like a meow, meow cat? Or is it like, you know, this grumbling cat suggesting that's a bigger or a smaller feline if that's what it is? By the time that you're processing all this consciously, my son just got eaten by a tiger, okay? That's not an adaptive mechanism. We are evolved to rapidly process and rapidly categorize. And that is not a bad thing. That's what's kept us alive for this long as a species. But it's also something that in the modern day context ends up producing these phenomena like racism and sexism and everything in between any of these isms that we hear about that split us off into groups, this concept of us versus them. Because at the end of the day, and, and racism actually makes sense, doesn't it? At the end of the day, we're, we're evolved to live in tribes, tiny self-contained tribes. And if we're living in our little tribe and we're nomadic and we're going from, you know, from over here where we're following the herd to over there where we're following the herd, and all of a sudden somebody, we don't know this person, comes up over a hill. We have to very rapidly tell whether or not that person is there to harm us or to help us. Are they going to take our resources? Are they there to share resources with us? We don't know that. So we rapidly make a categorization of basically friend or foe. Us versus them, in other words, right? And there's different ways to do that. Obviously, if a person is of a different race, well, this is something where in terms of actually being in the same environment of people of all different races of a melting pot, that's a relatively new phenomenon in terms of the history of humanity in the first place. So it's something where evolutionarily, if the person came over and they look totally different than we do, we're going to say that person's in a different tribe. And that tribe, I don't know why they would kind of need us other than to take our stuff to take our resources. And so we automatically have this sense of kind of like, oh, I don't know. I don't know about that person, right? I'm just gonna, I'm gonna leave them over there for right now. Now I'm in academia, right? And in academia, I can tell you right now, people are not overtly racist, right? But it's something where I can tell you that, you know, around my predominantly white colleagues, they're not exactly calling me up and asking me to go to dinner with them at conferences when they go out to dinner. Now, it's not because I'm a terrible dinner guest, I hope, although I'm certainly biased in that regard, thinking I'm a pretty good guest at these things, but it's something where I just don't naturally slide into the group. It, it just doesn't happen, right? So a lot of people say, okay, but how about de-biasing? 
Uh, I know a lot about implicit bias. I'm learning this stuff. I don't want to have that automatic preference because that's what it is, right? Racism, sexism, all of these things. What it is is an automatic preference for one group over the other, usually because it's either the societally majority group. It's a group where societally, just culturally speaking, we classically condition, like think about it. It's all the overwhelming preponderance of movies. It is a white male hero. Right. And because of that, we end up, you know, projecting onto white males, you know, this, this certain sense. Right. Uh, and obviously that's changing and these things. That's a good thing. But it's also an automatic preference that we have. And we have found automatic preferences for all sorts of stuff. Just because you have an automatic preference, let's say for individuals who are white over non-white, it does not mean that you're racist. It doesn't. Right. And just because you have an automatic preference for uh, individuals who happen to be straight versus who happen to not be straight or because you have an automatic preference for men relative to women in certain areas of academia, whatever it is, it does not mean that you're sexist or that you're a bigot or anything like that. It is literally a natural consequence of, of human evolution. It's what we do with those automatic preferences that counts. Now, the issue is, is that meta-analytically, if you've never heard of a meta-analysis, I mentioned that you got 10 studies on a topic, right? But all of them have found slightly different things, and you're not quite sure what are the good ones and what are the bad ones. Meta-analysis is you take the finding from all 10, you put them together, and you say what comes up, what is kind of the superordinate truth that if you take everything and you quantitatively synthesize it, what comes out of it, all right? And so when you do that in terms of debiasing techniques, what you end up finding is that they work. There are dozens of debiasing interventions. Some people make a lot of money going around running workshops and these things. And I run debiasing workshops too. If you're watching this and you need an implicit bias trainer, please hire me. I got a four hour and an eight hour one and I love doing it. But here's the thing, right? Is that if anybody tries to tell you that they can debias your team, they're lying. Because what we see is that if you do, sh if you do an intervention and you end up measuring before and then immediately after the team's automatic preferences, and we evaluate this using something called the implicit attitudes test or the implicit associations test, it's the same thing, right? And I can explain that sometime. But essentially what the idea is here is that if you do it immediately after the intervention, for example, maybe you end up taking people that are you know, men and women uh, and you put them on the same sports team and you have them kind of do stuff and then you take a look at gender bias afterwards, there will be less bias. Okay, especially if they've had recent positive interactions. If you do a uh, scientific manipulation where uh, you're going to see a doctor and the doctor happens to be a person of a different race, for example, and then you add and you have a good interaction with that doctor and then you do the bias test again after the racial ethnic bias goes down. But here's the problem. We have not been able to figure out how to sustain the debiasing, right? So people either call it the elasticity effect. There's a lot of different names for the effect. But the idea is, is that meta-analytically what we find is that you get short-term debiasing with any of these techniques that exist. And then immediately it snaps back, right? Because this is a consequence of human evolution. And it's not something that can be fixed overnight. Uh, it's not something, I mean, it is something that's built in systemically. There's no doubt about that. I've been working in corrections and criminal justice for over 10 years now. And my area of expertise is risk assessment. So it's predicting the likelihood that a person who's in prison, if we put them back in the community, what's the likelihood they're going to come back? And you want to know what we find? We end up finding that individuals who are ethnic minorities, these tools end up finding that they're at higher risk. And people say, ah, the tools are racist. These are some racist tools. But the way that, that this works is that the only way that we can build the tools is by taking data on the people already in the system. And the people already in the system are disproportionately ethnic minorities. So, of course, the tools are going to find that they're more at risk to be able to come back because that's what the data is in the first place. This is an incredibly complex issue, incredibly complex. And people right now are incredibly angry. And I would argue that one of the reasons they're angry is you have to think about the evolved mechanism of anger. What does anger mean as one of the primary emotions? Our primary emotions are happiness, sadness, anger, fear, surprise, and disgust, right? Why is it that we get angry? Anger, the function of anger as an emotion is that we're trying to push something away, right? We want to get it away from us. If I'm angry, it's like, get it away. When we're babies, we cry. And we cry because we can't communicate because we don't know how to do it. Adults, we still cry sometimes, right? But when we want to express that we don't like something, but we don't have any way to fight it necessarily, 
we have to find a way to communicate it. And what we're seeing right now is essentially human babies in terms of saying, I don't know how to communicate how upset I am. I, and you have every right to be upset. I'm upset. You have every right to be upset about what's going on right now. But people going out and destroying things and these things, it is the only way they know how to communicate. Uh, I, I've got a history of depression. Uh, luckily, I'm great now and have been for many years, right? But back in my grad school days, I had clinical depression. And and thank God, you know, truly, I, I never had any issues in terms of like uh, cutting in these things. But I've certainly known a lot of people who end up cutting. And if you ask them about the the phenomenological experience of cutting when they do it, they basically say, I need to feel something it is a method of communication. That action is a method of communication, even though it's not verbal in nature. And destruction and trying to tear things down, that expression of outward rage is because we have no control over something that is this systemic and that has literally been built up over tens of thousands of years of evolution. It is a very complicated situation. But this is essentially where racism comes from in the first place. Now, it's one of these things where if you end up thinking about prejudice versus discrimination, prejudice is the feeling, discrimination is the action. And you guys know as well as I do, you can have people who, even though it's rare, who are neither prejudiced nor discriminatory, you can have people who are prejudiced and they discriminate. KKK folks, right? Then you can have people who are very prejudiced, but they don't discriminate, okay? And these are kind of very bigoted people, okay? And then you have people who discriminate, but they're actually not prejudiced. They grew up in the environment and they're just kind of doing things or saying things, etc., that are discriminatory, even though if they were to really evaluate it, underlying it, they don't really have the prejudice. It's a very odd thing, right? So you can build that two-by-two two matrix of prejudice and discrimination. Now, it used to be that, you know, people were more prejudiced, I would argue, people were more prejudiced than they are now, but overt discrimination also happened a lot more often. These days, you're seeing the discrimination right? Uh, now you are, right? But the discrimination uh, largely has been pressed down to the point where just the prejudices are there, and it results in the bias being expressed in much more implicit ways. And this isn't just racism. Th this is everything, right? It's relationships between uh, the sexes, right, in terms of the workplace and in other environments. Uh, it has to do with gender identity and gender politics and these things, uh, it is, it's, it's a fascinating area of study, but what we're seeing right now is it play out in real life. Uh, and I'm interested to see what happens, but I figured I would make this video and just explain a little bit of what's going on. Please do share this video if you think that anybody can actually get anything out of it. Uh, and like I said, if anybody needs debiasing training, uh, even though, let me tell you, it's going to work short term, not long term. What I would argue that what people need is implicit bias training. An implicit bias training that is evidence-based. Everybody and their mother seems to be offering implicit bias training, but they don't know what they're talking about, right? Because they're trying to sell you something as opposed to educate in a way that actually makes sense. Feel free to get in touch with me. Uh, my email address is jay sing, which is S-I-N-G-H, Zurich, which is Z-U-R-I-C-H at gmail.com. Dr. J. Phoenix Singh, I would love to hear from you. Thanks so much. Bye-bye.